Hi, welcome to Cafe Tutunai. Today we're very happy to have a special guest, uh, Professor James Lynch, Dr. James Lynch. He is the chair of the business management department at Brooklyn CUNY. Yes. Hello, James. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Peter. I'm glad to be here. So can you uh, do a brief introduction of yourself? Sure. I'm, I'm actually the uh, current, as you said, I'm the current chair of um, the business management department in Copeland School of Business. Um, we are the largest department on campus. Hmm. Uh, we teach about, um, have anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 students a year wow. out of the 18,000 uh, go through our department in uh, mm -hmm. that context. I teach, I'm a recovering attorney. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. I have. Oh no! Yeah, no, 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 no! A lot of people out there already. I can feel them saying, "I'm out of here." Yeah, no, no judgment. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. A lot of people. I understand it. I understand attorneys have a lot of uh, challenges in the world, but um, I teach uh, business law. Mm. I teach negotiation. Okay. And I teach happiness and spirituality in the workplace. Wow. So, so well, no judgment. <laughs> You teach uh, happiness as spirituality, and spirituality while workers. suing someone? Like, how does yeah. it work? <laughs> no, no the, goal is, the goal is to um, go beyond the superficial ideas about how we relate to each other in the society. Okay. Right? And right. so many people are suffering so much stress in the world today. Mm -hmm. Right? We know this reality. Put COVID aside. Right. Put COVID aside. Right. Um, so many people are overwhelmed by the societies in which we live in mm -hmm. around the world. Right. Technology. Um, What's their place in the world? Mm -hmm. What's their future like? What's the planet's future going to be like? Right. So there's so much stress. So it's so very important to be able to come back, what I'm going to say, come home. Come home. Come home mm -hmm. to where there's peace, mm -hmm. where there's love, where there's compassion. Right. Where you know it's possible. Right. And right. A lot of times people don't feel it's possible. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to feel that it's possible. So in a way, my happiness class and my negotiation class mm -hmm. are both pathways for the students to come home. To mm. himself. Nice, nice. So home is really not a place per se, but somewhere within yeah, us. Exactly, exactly. So it's really, you know, we had, before we started, we had some conversation. And for me, I, I'm a Buddhist practitioner. Sure. Um, and um, our practice and modality is to say we are part of one great life. Mm -hmm. We're all part. So one of the difficulties that human beings frequently have is the idea of separation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're there, I'm there, my right. tribe, my group, my whatever. Right. But if we can see life as one great movement of hope and love, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter what we look like, it doesn't right. matter where we are, things can be radically different. Right. Because right now, our society can be very tribal, very tribal. and very conflicting. Yes. Right. And I think one thing that's special about you is not only you teach, you're also the president of the Buddhist Council of New York. Yeah, I didn't bring that up, but yeah, I'm the president <laughs> of the Buddhist Council of New York, and as we were saying before, I'm the first lay person, I believe, to be the president of the Buddhist Council. First lay first person. First lay person. Uh, it was really a monastic group of monks and nuns mm -hmm. um, who came together to have a space where they could talk mm -hmm. freely, yeah. you know, about the concerns in the Buddhist community. Uh, what's exciting is uh, we represent over about, I'd say, 1.2 million Buddhists here in the New York Tri-State area. 1.2. We 2 have 2 that many. We yeah. have that many. Wow. Primarily in the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I take that role very seriously. Yeah. Uh, I integrate it into my work, of course. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's a different modality. That mm -hmm. modality is, I call it a spiritual modality, mm -hmm. where I represent the Buddhist community sure. to the greater society mm -hmm. in the world. That's what I look at. How do you integrate your Buddhist philosophy, spiritual practice with what you teach? Because, you know, sometimes when we think about business, <laughs> the idea is the more the better. <laughs> well, that's right? one of the dangers. The, the capitalist that's, way of thinking, right? Well, that's one of the dangers. And I did write some notes down, you know, to prepare because I think this is crucial and critical. One of the um, things that people are making mistake is the idea of the ego. Buddhism is fundamentally an addressing of the ideas and the thoughts in one's head to move away from egoistic ideology mm -hmm. or ideation, right? right? I don't right. speak in, <laughs> in teacher speak, but an ideation <laughs> of who we think we are and the right. thoughts we have to an understanding that we are interconnected. Mm -hmm. You know. Some of the great Buddhist masters who have been active in the last 20 years, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh, for mm -hmm. example, sure. talks about interbeing, 
Right. right? Important. He'll look at something like a flower, and he said the flower is the sun, it's the water, it's the minerals. Right. right. So when we begin that process of looking at our lives as being an integrated process, mm -hmm. then we move away from the idea of constant consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be no different than if you have your left hand, your left hand gets cut, you don't sit there and let it bleed, say, oh, I'm, I, the right hand now has more blood, right? You don't think that way, right? As That's soon as it. the left hand is cut, right. the right hand doesn't think of itself, mm -hmm. it immediately grabs the hand or whatever it does. Right. In the same way, if we're really seeing life as it is, mm -hmm. then we recognize that there is a continuity between my life and your life. Right, right. It doesn't mean that we don't exist or that the ego that we, our thoughts are mm -hmm. not important, right? But it means to put them in the proper place. Mm -hmm. So from there, we have proper business. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand that, right. you will always have conflict. You will have conflict, right? Eventually, right. I want more, you want less. I want what you have, right? You, right, you know, right. Yeah. Egoistic thinking, right. um, an illusion of a person, self, living being, mm -hmm. or lifespan causes us to become frightful or afraid or right. offensive. And so all those things, Buddhism are Dharma doors mm -hmm. through which we can find compassion and hope. Right. Right. So I give my students hope. Sorry too much. But, <laughs> no, so. no, I think this is, it's a very good analogy. If the left hand recognizes the right hand, even if the left hand is doing business with the right hand, mm -hmm. it's a very different relationship Same versus this hand has nothing to do with this hand. Exactly. It's a very different kind of concept that which you will create conflict. So what kind of, uh, what kind of teaching or pedagogy that you have to teach your student this kind of concept? I, right? I, I use none, well, you know, what we just said is the foundational understanding of my teaching. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily have to mention Buddhism at all. Right. Right? Right. Um, I use some things that I've learned in different contexts. Mm -hmm. One of them is the six human needs. Six? Six human needs. You may never heard this before, so. No. <laughs> the six human needs is part of a training I learned as a, something called strategic interventionism. Okay. And um, I use this as a Dharma door. Okay. Every human being has six human needs. Okay. And you'll see this, you can even apply this to businesses or organizations. Oh, interesting. So once you learn this, mm. it is very s simplistic. It takes, let's say, three minutes. Okay. Very simple to learn. Okay. Uh, and not too difficult to apply. Uh-huh. Um, first one, certainty. All okay. human beings uh -huh. need a certain amount of certainty. Well, that's true. <laughs> Look, we're sitting in this room. I'm sitting with you. We have camera people. We have cameras here. Uh -huh. If we felt that we were sitting here and all of a sudden we were going to get electrocuted in every two minutes, <laughs> we wouldn't sit here. Right. Right? right. So we, each human being has a certain amount of certainty that mm. they need. Mm -hmm. But too much certainty is boring. I always give an example of this with my students. Uh, let's say someone says they love you. They're crazy about you. They right. think you're wonderful. Right. And every day they come to want to surprise you and they knock on the door at four in the morning and say, I love you. Here's a rose. <laughs> after the first two times, you say, wow, this person's really into me. This is sexy. This is exciting. <laughs> but after the first 16 months, when that knock on the door came, they go, guess what? You'd say, you yeah. love me, and you care about me, yeah. and you brought me a flower. Right, You're right, right? right, right. right. I, will, I will want to change another person. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. Right. So too much certainty becomes boring. Mm -hmm. Our nervous systems, the way they're designed, requires variety. Right. right? That's a biological reality. Right. We're sitting in these seats. I'm seated, mm -hmm. you're seated. Right. If I said to you, you're going to sit here for another 20 hours, mm -hmm. already you begin to get uncomfortable. <laughs> the camera people is getting uncomfortable, right? We right. got to get out of here. They're right? like, we didn't sign right? up for this. You know? Right, so too much certainty <laughs> is no good. Right. So the body needs variety. Mm -hmm. So the second human need is variety. Ah, change. Change. Mm. You heard that before? Sure. <laughs> In Buddhism, right? Impermanence. Right, right. So there it is. Variety, change, uh -huh. okay? So there's a, there's a movement between those two. And the third one is significant. Okay. People, you're dressed a certain way. I've lost my hair, so I don't shave it anymore. <laughs> well, Other people here have their hair, right? So, I have empathy for you. <laughs> right? So here's the key. You're wearing a certain clothing. You have certain glasses. I have contacts on. Right. I have bracelet on. All because they express something in me. Mm -hmm. Right? right. Even in the monastic community, it's very interesting. That's why they shave their hair and they wear the same. Right. To de-emphasize the ego. Right. 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 But the average person is significant. That's mm. what they 
one. So that's why they dress a certain way, they speak a certain way, uh -huh. those types of things. So significance right. is a key one, right? right? The fourth human need is connection and love. Uh -huh. Every human being needs connection and love. But a lot of times people say, uh, love is scary, I don't want love. <laughs> I'm dealing with this connection business. I'm not here for the love business, I'm here for the connection business. And that's why we join groups, associations. Mm -hmm. They touch on the other human need, don't they? When I'm in the group, it gives me significance too, doesn't right, it? Right. It also gives me certainty. I go to organizations, I go to my Buddhist organization, where I go, we're going to pray, I have a certainty about the rituals and practices mm -hmm. that we do. Right. And it gives me significance. So they kind of overlap when you see mm -hmm. them. Sure. Right? And then so that was connection and love. Mm -hmm. The final two are aspirational. Okay. All things need to either grow, uh -huh. right? Grow. Okay. Flowers, you, you know, a growth. You, the flower sits there, you put it in the thing, it wants to grow. Mm -hmm. But we too want to grow. Right. Right? Right, you right, right. Know, you're a professor, you went to school, right. you got your degrees, you wanted to grow, you wanted mm -hmm. to be able to contribute. Right. That's a six human need, okay. to contribute to something greater mm -hmm. than the egoistic self. Very, mm -hmm. very interesting and very profound right. ideas, right. right? Right. We all want to actualize ourselves and we all want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, that meets our need of being special and significant. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because you're special, you help other people to feel special which mm -hmm. give you certainty and exactly. change exactly. and variety. So this is the first Dharma door. Okay. I use these, I won't call it Buddhism, they know I'm a Buddhist practitioner, <laughs> I don't hide that, but I, you don't have to be a Buddhist practitioner, you can use these Dharma doors if you're Christian or Jewish mm -hmm. or Muslim right. or Sufi, right. you know, uh, Sikh, you could be anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I use them. Okay. And so I say what we did right here was was a theoretical model, mm -hmm. but I actually have the students then apply this to their life. Huh, interesting. So, so for example, if you're having problems, you don't tell them, well, you may because you write something out, you don't say it to the group, right? right. But you may have problems with your, your mother, or you may have problems with your husband, or mm -hmm. your wife, or your children. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, we may use the same language. For example, two people may say they love each other, but one person is satisfying significance. Mm -hmm. Another person is satisfying certainty. Mm -hmm. So you can have the same words, but the meaning can be different. Right, right. That's correct. And how you say it to a person, how do you know you're loved? Some people say, I know I'm loved when someone tells me. Mm -hmm. Another person says, and I have a large class, usually about 100 students. Sure. So one person will say, they tell me. Another person will say, when the person shows me. I uh -huh. said, see, these two people will have a problem. <laughs> they will have a problem. Because one person will say, I show you every day, I show you, but you never tell me. Uh-huh. Another person says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Another person says, I don't care you say you love me every day. What are you doing? You're not showing me. Right, right. So it's very, it's the process of beginning, I hope, I hope, mm -hmm. is for the person to begin to have the ears to hear the other person, the cries of the mm -hmm. person they're in relationship with, mm -hmm. even if it's in their community. It may be in their temple or their mosque or their mm -hmm. synagogue, to begin to hear people differently too. Which you really need to really be a very mindful listener because only when you're mindful you're able to hear people's need, right? Exactly. Do they need certainty or do they need love and connection? Exactly. Right. So, so, so the example you gave was like, so excellent, right? I mean, I need you to show me love and you need me to tell you love. Exactly. And I don't know what showing means, because showing could be like, I need a big diamond, I don't know. Some, for some people it is. <laughs> for some people, some people that, that is, is, right? That is. Right. Like, that if you is. love me, you have to show me Absolutely. This, right? That's but real. For some, I say that. for some who just simple, hey, exactly. how are you today? It means a lot for different people. Exactly. And so that's why, for me, this is a dormant door for the beginning of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Because to be mindful is to really hear what the universe is telling us. Mm -hmm. It is not a simply a way to get more stuff. Right. Right? Or to get um, more badges from the society. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you're doing this or doing that. So right. a, lot of time, a lot of times everyone's talking about the mindfulness of business, the mindful of sexuality. Of mindful. <laughs> yes, the, that's wonderful too. I'm not mm. disparaging that. Right. That's beautiful. But that's just one small beginning Dharma door mm -hmm. to the true essence of mindfulness. Right. 
Mindfulness is the beginning of harmonization of the society mm -hmm. so that we can have love and compassion for each other. So that's an important point to remind our audience that sometimes when people are interested in mindfulness practice, they're more interested just to calm themselves down and then make more money or something like that. <laughs> I'm not against that. <laughs> I'll uh, give my address later if you can send me the money. <laughs> nothing wrong with that, but at the same at the same time, the the, no. the more, more there's a, oh, tremendous a bigger difference. goal behind absolutely self gain absolutely. And, and self you know actualization, absolutely. which is service, right? Absolutely. Well, it's one of the things that you just said was the key point. The key point. A lot of people don't know why. Buddhism says, or the path of even the six, you know, six human needs begins to say, peacefulness is necessary so that you can see how your mind is behaving, mm -hmm. right? right. If, you're, if you're jumping around all the time, like they say called monkey mind, from one thing to another, you can't even know how you're feeling, mm -hmm. right? right? So peacefulness gives us a way to be mindful and see how our mind is moving from one thing to another. Right. That's powerful. The next thing for me, for my mindfulness, is to say, I am more than my thinking. That's powerful. You are more than your I thinking. I am more than my thinking. And I'm not just my physical body. Mm. Very, very profound. Right? Right. Because a lot of times we think, the thoughts we think, and you're a psychologist, <laughs> right? <laughs> the cognitive behavioral therapy, that's right. part of the whole thing, right? The right. whole idea is to recognize we're not our thoughts. Exactly. Buddhism, that's what it is. You sit there, you meditate, breathing in. I feel solid. Or you might do mountain solid, whatever you mm -hmm. do. It's to begin, you realize, oh, I'm thinking about the person who uh, disrespected me. Oh, I thought about a time when I was a child. All of a sudden, you didn't call those thoughts up. You didn't say, oh, I'm going to think about when I was a child or the person who disrespected me. Right. All of a sudden, you said, I'm not that thought. That moment, that is the beginning of deeper mindfulness, to ask the question of who am I? Mm -hmm. That's powerful. So mindfulness is really something, it's an entry point for us to, again, to sort of search ourselves, exactly. to explore ourselves, exactly. and ask good questions about exactly. what life is about. Exactly. And that's transformative because then all of a sudden you don't, you go on the subway, then you're not, uh, my ego is interacting with that person's ego. So when I was on my way here to this thing, uh, a woman came in who obviously was mentally challenged. And she came in and she's tense and yeah. Another woman gets up and says, I'm going, you get up, beat the heck out of We're in New York. <laughs> We're in New York, she says, I'm going to beat the heck out of you, right? And I'm sitting there and I just, uh, tried to send what they call meta, loving to calm the situation mm. from my mind. But that's what happens. Mm -hmm. She's reacting to the fear she feels because this woman is a threat to her. Right. Rather than an opportunity, what's going on? Maybe another person gets up there and says, Miss, are you okay? I have some food for you. I have a bottle of water. Maybe you need $5. Different, same, same interaction, mm. different response. Right. 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 All comes from our awareness of what's happening inside of ourselves. Because it's all right to be afraid. I can mm. be afraid. If some woman may cut me, I don't know what's mm. going to happen. Right, that's but correct. But to be mindful of what's going on allows you to have mm -hmm. a different response. Right, and I think it's good that you bring up this example because I think, I guess the past few years, people, I would say people become a bit more afraid. Of course. Not just about COVID. Of course. But it's about how this xenophobia. Of course. This uh, discrimination. <laughs> and and, and so, so I wonder how do you sort of teach your students to deal with real conflict that all New Yorkers or Americans kind of need to face, especially the minorities, right? Yes, like, of for me, as an Asian guy, I've never been in a time where they have to be afraid that someone may attack me now. No, it's a very serious time. Um, in my role as the president of the Buddhist Council, we started the New York Peace Team, mm. in which we're training people. They don't have to be Buddhist. As a matter of fact, we've made it interfaith. The idea of um, various people coming together to learn things such as um, bystander intervention training, ah. all right? um, compassionate communication. Mm -hmm. All of those things are important mm -hmm. because they begin to allow us to know we can be positive agents of change in our environment. Mm -hmm. When you're afraid, it's because you believe the self can be harmed. Right. right? We, as you know, we just did the uh, recent, there was a recent thing the Buddhist Council took action uh, on behalf and support of the Asian community, which was the love walk, yes. mindful love walk and pilgrimage. 
That's right. Why do we do that? People said, why, I'm black guy, why is he calling for this? That's mm -hmm. the president. Because right. of what I said at the beginning. We have to remember, if the left hand is hurt, the right hand doesn't say it's the left hand. The right, right hand just says, act. Mm -hmm. If that was what, that's what came out of me initially, mm -hmm. act, we must help. I'm not saying if it was the town community, act. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And uh, you show me the beautiful facility that you have here, wonderful. You went and you saw the people in Haiti, you acted. Mm -hmm. right? right? That's powerful because it changes the life, the mind and life of the actor and the one who's being acted upon. Sure. So I try to help my students to begin to be mindful that they don't have to be afraid, mm -hmm. that they can be helpful. Yeah, that mindful walk that you did a few weeks ago is a, it's a powerful gesture mm -hmm. to let the Asian community know that you are with us, yes. right? It's like when, when we feel people are there supporting us and make the community feel more ready to face the difficulties. That's oh, real. Yeah. One of my professors, uh, I don't think it's, I want to say her name because she didn't give me permission to say her name. <laughs> dialogue, uh, she came remotely to that event and she was recently, two days, what's today? Today is uh, Friday, five days ago, she was attacked. Oh wow, seriously? Yes, Man. threw water at her, threw things on her. I can't say the words that they called her. Right, um, right. Uh, but it was very important that she had already known that I had helped organize the walk, had sent the things so that she could participate on Zoom. So she knew I wasn't just talking superficially when I then said, hey, I'm here to support you 100%. Mm -hmm. So now she's out and about again. She was suffering very much. She was afraid to come out of her house. Oh. Brilliant professor, brilliant professor. Um, young woman, about 35. And now she's, okay, I'm okay. She sent me a picture saying, I'm okay now. Oh, excellent. Yeah, excellent. but I think that's why you sow the seed. You sow the seed so that when the conditions are ripe for love and compassion and kindness and joy to manifest, mm -hmm. you've planted them, you've watered the seeds. And when difficulties come, mm -hmm. because they will. Right. You know, they will. You're in a position to handle those pains. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not living in a fantasy land, there are no weeds, there are no weeds, there are no weeds, and mm -hmm. they take over your garden. Right. <laughs> you that's know? correct. But I think one thing you've mentioned that's important also for our audience is that we, we don't need to be a spiritual practitioner to do any of these. Yeah. When you see someone needs help as a bystander, there are things you can do Absolutely. to help your fellow citizen. Absolutely. So what you're really talking about is also citizenship. Absolutely. Right? Citizenship. So can you elaborate a little bit more about the, the peaceful bystander training? Yeah, well, what is it about? That bystander uh, training is uh, really exciting. We got uh, in contact. I had, there are a lot of people who do bystander training. Okay. But what I wanted to do was something that was harmonious with what we've discussed already. And the number one group that I saw that was doing that was something called the DC Peace Team. You guys can look them up, 10 seconds, on the, we all have our phones sure. up here, <laughs> you look them up. And so I was trained in that on how to be a trainer, to train other people to do that. Okay. And what that is, is when people sometimes are in conflict, how can we be the agent or cause to stop the conflict mm -hmm. or to lower the conflict? Right. Right. To de-escalate. To de-escalate. Right. So it's really profound, I think, de-escalation training. Mm -hmm. But the training also impacts the people who learn it mm -hmm. because it reminds us that we have a point of view that is often limited and can cause harm. Mm -hmm. So you want to have flexibility right. there. So the training is, like you said, civic. You know, I want to make sure that my students are dynamic individuals in the society. They don't mm. have to go to a mountain. They don't have to go and meditate a special way. Right, right. You know, that's not necessary. Right. What is necessary is for them to be, value their own life. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. Right. I'd say, I want you to, you come here, the universe is designed, and I say, I talk like this to my class. Sure. I said, the universe is designed that you have come here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to you inside of your life. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but I'm asking for you to let it out. Right. That's the way I talk. So, in the same way that you were saying about uh, the nonviolent bystander. Sometimes we can act, sometimes we cannot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's prudent to act, sometimes it's prudent to call for help. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're moving in constant with, I want to be an agent of my own good and good for others, mm -hmm. then, that, then something good comes. And I have amazing stories from students, amazing students. Mm -hmm. Years later, 10 years later, I give them a marble. <laughs> I give them a marble at the end, of, and again, it doesn't have to be religious. I give them a marble and say, the world's going to make you change your shape. Mm -hmm. 
Someone's going to ask you to change your shape or to change your values or beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I want you to hold on to this marble and remember to keep your shape. Wow. In difficulty. Keep mm -hmm. that shape. Keep that shape in difficulty. And I've had students uh, take a picture of you know, your car. You have the little cup there with the stuff. They keep the marble there and say, Professor, it's been 10 years. I just had a tough meeting and I kept my shape. <laughs> right? So I feel that it, it can have an impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So you say you have some wonderful story. Would you want to share one story about your student, how they kept their shape? Oh, so well, um, one, uh, one student, uh, father had died mm -hmm. during 9-11 as a result of cancer. Oh. And she had been overwhelmed. She came into my happiness class and my negotiation class, mm -hmm. and she was overwhelmed with grief. Mm -hmm. And after she wanted to change her major. She went to, I think, St. John. She was a transfer student. She took my class. She said, I'm overwhelmed. Why would my father be taken from me? I don't see why I should live. Right. She had many very painful right. things, maybe even hurting her own life. Right. And uh, last week, she sent me a note and said, Professor, I want you to know I had a professor who changed my life, who made me able to live, to gain me hope. It's very, so I very, get emotional because right. that's worth it more than the money. Yes, right? that's correct. That's, that's correct. The real value of teaching. Right. Not when I say teaching, you reveal for the student hopefully the value of their life, whatever they want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when they write me back, she said, uh, "You saved my life. Mm -hmm. You gave me hope. Right. I'm. I now have double major. I'm graduating because I helped her design her own uh, curriculum, mm -hmm. and another professor after that designed her own curriculum." And she's graduating at the top of the school. And so that's powerful for me. That's, that's a story. That is the joy of teaching. I can identify what, some of what you're saying because I do, of course, also have students who really write sort of very uh, heartfelt messages back to me after they graduate. And they say they learn, they remember my message about exploring oneself, for example, and how they apply that in their own new lifestyle so so it is correct you know it's like one of the joy of teaching is actually transforming other people in a way that also make us transform that goes back to the needs you were talking about yeah. how we feel significant and how we help other to feel significant exactly. exactly and so when you have that conversation and i know i saw you did a great presentation about the transforming it was great no i i thought it was fantastic i saw it <laughs> if you can share with the people, I think it's wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, made me always think, you know, that we all have the capacity for change and revealing our greatness inside of us. Mm -hmm. That's what the message you were saying. So, yeah, I can see you doing that, right, for your students. Um, a lot of times we, we don't realize that. Mm -hmm. Our society tells you you're only valuable if you make money. Well, right. yeah. If yeah. you're famous, or if you're, and that's why some people harm themselves before they on Instagram or or Facebook, they're mm -hmm. committing suicide and putting it on Facebook. Yeah, I'm famous now. Yeah, you know, um, but if we can see, cherish every encounter, realize the encounter with another human being is special. Mm -hmm. Don't 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 go home and just say my child or your wife. Ah, I don't have time for you. I may never see. I take care of my father, for example. My father has mm. dementia. I left him to come here. Wow. Uh, he has dementia. And um, one of the things I, I say, one day he asks me, he gets mad at me, and we sit down and talk at 2 or 3 in the morning, and I mm. say, one day one of us won't be here. Mm. But I have you now. That's a very uh, right? touching. <laughs> it's, it's the reality, right? Yeah. It's the reality. But if we do that with the people we love, and they may be our significant other, our children, or whomever it is, or a teacher, or a friend, we realize how sacred that moment is, and mm -hmm. it may never come. In fact, it won't come back again. Mm -hmm. And then once you realize that, then you have an obligation to be present, to be mindful, to be mm -hmm. loving. It right. changes everything. Right, right. I think. So when you're teaching your happiness at class, yes. I assume this is sort of yes. some of the key message Absolutely. you have. Absolutely. Um, and I have, <laughs> they don't listen to me. <laughs> so I have many, many videos, many, many video presentations. Mm -hmm. um, that are funny, or, okay. or, or insightful, you know, and then I say, well, what happened there? What did we see here? Mm -hmm. What happened? I tell them, stand guard at the gate of your mind, but I have a series of videos to make them understand, oh, 
if I'm not standing guard in my game of mind, maybe I'm being led astray by something else I'm seeing or someone's mm -hmm. selling me something. You know, and so uh, those are things that I hope mm -hmm. are being transmitted. That's yeah, right. that this is, I, and I guess your teaching and your job at a Buddhist council, they really go. I hope so. I've been very fortunate. Hand to hand. I call, call the Buddha's arrangement. I call the Buddha's <laughs> arrangement. Who, I mean, I was one of the first teachers, you know, to get the opportunity to teach happiness. I've been teaching it over 12 years. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of a booming field in the last six or seven years. People are writing about it. Right. You know, right. Now I'm going to write about it, but I've been teaching right. in it for about 12 years. Right. And so initially, one of the professors said, oh, you, you studied religion when you were an undergraduate. Would you like to teach this area of happiness, value, stress? I said, I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do in the beginning, but um, now I have a good curriculum, I think. Nice, nice. So you've been teaching it for 12 years. Yeah, 12 years. That's quite, that's a, <laughs> you're quite a happy guy. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. No, I, and, then, and the key is, I think, my students saw me when my mother was transitioning from lung cancer. I was still teaching them. I was telling them that was going on. Mm -hmm. So this is not like um, Fantasy Island. Well, you're not going to have difficulties. No one's right. going to pass away. Right. You know, but can you see even the joy in the movement as people transition? I term mm -hmm. as they pass. My mother is still here. You know, how is she touching me? How am I a part mm -hmm. of her life? Right. What did she move? And we we move on. So one of the secrets of being happy is to really take our time seriously. Yes. Yes. And to... In fact, in our society, it's exactly the opposite. We're always doing something else. <laughs> We're always compartmentalizing, okay? We always are, which is fine. Right. But at the same time, if we can go home, go home, mm -hmm. then you'll feel differently. So I really like the, the way you put it, right? That the whole, your, the whole mindfulness and spiritual, or any spiritual practice, <coughs> is really to come home. If you can go home, you can stop the conflict in yourself. Mm. You can stop saying, I am this and I want to become that. Our thoughts often act as barriers to our happiness. Mm -hmm. And so if we can go away from the racing mind, be in that moment, you'll be okay. You can feel it. It's palpable. Right, right. I mean, home is such an important place for all of us. Mm -hmm. It is a sort of this inner peace that we all can find if we spend our time to look for it. I think so. Right. So as a president of Buddhist Council, what is your plan that help, other than the Buddhist community, but like in general, like what is your overall plan well, to promote I, happiness? Well, two things. I've, the Buddhist Council primarily was an insular group. So I think they wanted to make a move to become secular in the sense of it more engaged with the world. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things we've tried to do. We've tried to become more engaged in an interfaith way. Okay. And we've tried to do through the Tuchis Foundation as well. Sure. I'm being honest. Um, be more engaged in doing things in the community here in the New York City area. That's very important. Mm -hmm. That, because a lot of times people think Buddhism is I sit down, I'm peaceful while everybody else is stabbing each other, right? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, I've meditated and everybody else do your own uh, thing, right? Oh, jeez. Right? <laughs> right, right. It's not that. It's being peaceful steps in the world. Tucci Foundation is helping with us with regards to the food pantries that we're doing around the city mm -hmm. with other Buddhist Dharma centers, saying, we want to do that too. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? That's powerful, mm -hmm. right? giving people a vehicle so that they can be active in their own community, not has to join, just showing us the way. Mm -hmm. That's important. Right. Right? And at the same time, still saying that those communities are very important for um, the work that they do with their own um, community. Right. That's important too. Mm -hmm. Both. So at the same time, so my role as a president is to revere the monks and nuns for what they're doing, to recognize they are a continuation of the Buddhist path, mm -hmm. the Buddhist steps, Right. And to broaden that out so more people can see that. Right. And I noticed that you do connect with other religious groups, not just the Buddhists. My, very much so. Right. You know, but some people think it's too fast. Some Buddhist <laughs> groups say, don't have them come to our meeting so much. They told me that. Right, Honestly, right, right. You know, which is okay. I, I can only, my, my rule is we only go a half a step. Mm -hmm. I have to go half a step. Right. Not so fast that I'm not hearing or mindful 
mm -hmm. of the concerns of the Buddhist community. But at the same time, we do a half a step, whether with the Quaker community right. or the Christian community, mm -hmm. all of those things, I've actively tried to move us into a deeper dialogue with mm -hmm. them. And that's right. what I wanted to do. I think the Buddhist Council serves as sort of a role model for all the Buddhist community mm -hmm. in New York City, because I think sometimes people like to stay with their own kind. But I think what you're doing is to really step out and get to know others. I hope so. Not just other Buddhists, yes, but other so. religious so. groups. And, and I think it's important because right now we're such a tribal nation. It's, we have to find ways to sort of break that trend. I agree. And that's one of, the, I think the best moments happen when, like in the Love Walk, when one of the rabbis came over to me and said, you're a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm a Buddhist. He, he, he said, you, this is different. Uh -huh. So he had a mindset, a notion of what it meant to be a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. right. right. People have some kind of like a fixed, notion, idea. A fixed idea. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. Right. So people can say, oh no, we need to have them engaged. They're not just there, may all living beings be peaceful, happy, and then we leave them and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what happens. A lot of times we're invited into interfaith communities. Right. They have us say, may all living beings be peaceful and free of worry, doubt, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then we go. Mm -hmm. But they're not engaging with us on how to create causes that can be transformative of hearts and minds that are hurting. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to use the word Buddha. Right. You know, right. Like, like we just did now. Right. right. We don't need to use the B word. No, we don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we don't. No, it makes it effective. Right, right, right. So for our audience, if you want to give them a, like a take-home message, what would you want to give them? Sort of what I said in the beginning, I always give the same, you're more important than you think you are. Your life is connected to the life of the universe, and the causes you make today will transform the world tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful... That's a very nice way of putting it. So our, we and you are more than who we think we are. Right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a e easy to understand, hard to realize. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. If I think if we do those actions, then we won't have the strife. Then people will say, I, another tradition, I am my brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. I am my brother's keeper. And then we'll act from there. Great. So thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful no, you. uh, presentation, interview. And I, I really love your six basic needs. I hope so. I think that's something that all our audience can remember, those six basic needs, yes. right? The needs of right, constancy, the change, the significance, right? Love and connection. Yes. Right. Growth. Yes and Contrib really contribution. contribution. Yeah. So I think if our audience can remember those six needs and how to pay attention to those six needs, that would be really a wonderful yeah. way. Just doesn't matter what religion or exactly. ethnic background you're from. Exactly. That would be something. Oh, you will see your life change. I guarantee it. Yeah. I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. I've never had anybody take it seriously and then not have a fundamental change in how they look at their life in the world. Right. Big difference. Great, so hopefully we all can pay attention, be more mindful, and contribute. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.